Hello and welcome to the following lesson on the introduction to radioactivity, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQA A level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to introduce ourselves to radioactivity by looking and understanding the properties of radioactive emissions. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to understand why radioactivity occurs in nuclei, understand the different compositions of the types of radioactive emissions, and then understand the different properties of the different types of radioactive emissions, which links into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification 3.8.1.2 alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. So in France, scientist Henri Becquerel in 1881 realized that the element uranium was emitting energy in the form of particles. Now this seemed to break the laws of energy conservation known at the time because we know that energy can't be created or destroyed and it was seen that uranium was creating energy in the form of particles from nothing. However, this was solved when it was realized the energy was coming from the unstable nuclei of the uranium itself radioactively decaying and releasing nuclear radiation. So with this, Becquerel had discovered radiation and radioactivity. So this solved where the energy was coming from, but what in fact is nuclear radiation? What causes nuclear radiation to occur? And why do only some nuclei exhibit radioactive behavior? So nuclear radioactivity is the process of a nucleus becoming more stable in its configuration. So there are three types of radiation. There is alpha, beta and gamma radiation, which when a nucleus emits can turn it from an unstable nucleus into a more stable nucleus. So you can have either alpha, beta or gamma. Now why does each process increase the stability of the nuclei? So to understand which nuclei are unstable and wish to emit alpha, beta and gamma radiation, we've got to consider the nuclear stability curve, because this curve allows us to observe which processes increase the stability in different isotopes. So it looks at the relationship between the proton number and neutron number in the stability of a nucleus. So the stable and nearly stable atomic nuclei as a function of protons against neutrons shows the following idea. That actually, okay, for stable nuclei, the number for the number of protons has to equal the number of neutrons. But for large stable nuclei, the number of neutrons has to be greater than the number of protons. Now, why is this the case? Now, we can explain this trend by considering the forces inside a nucleus, which consists of mainly the attractive strong force and the repulsive electromagnetic force. So, if the strong and electromagnetic force are approximately equal in size, then nucleus is unstable, so it will make it susceptible to radioactive decay. Whilst if the strong force is much greater than the electromagnetic force, the nucleus is very stable and the nucleus will not decay. Whilst if electromagnetism was greater than the strong force, well then the nucleus would never even form because the repulsive force will be greater than the, elect than the attractive force. So it's important to note that this tells us why some nuclei form in the universe and why other nuclei are unstable. So firstly, for small nuclei, why do you get to the idea that the strong force is much larger than the electromagnetic force when the number of neutrons equals the number of protons? Well, it's because both the number of protons, that both the neutrons and the protons will experience the strong interaction, and the strong interaction is just greater than the electromagnetic interaction. So when they're equal in number, the strong force is much larger than the electromagnetic force. But for large nuclei, we have an issue. The, the nuclear radius has now become so large that the size of the strong interaction has decreased since the range of the strong interaction is now smaller than the nucleus itself. So to increase our strong interaction to make sure it is now greater than the electromagnetic interaction, you need to have a greater number of neutrons in the nucleus than there are protons to compensate for this range, the short range of the strong interaction, because the neutrons will exhibit the strong interaction and mediate that without the repulsive electromagnetic interaction whilst the protons will do both. So adding more protons will not have a, a much of a difference to this. So it's very important to know this. But please remember this can only be done for a certain amount of neutrons. Eventually if the diameter of the nucleus is much larger than the strong force range there'll still not be enough strong force produced across the nucleus to make it larger than the electromagnetic force. So this means that the size of the nucleus can only be approximately the size of the strong force interaction range, which is why the nucleus is so small in the atom. 
because eventually if the nucleus would increase in size so much that the electromagnetic force would be the dominant force still due to the short range of the strong force. So to increase the stability of the nucleus, we've got to decrease the nuclear diameter at that point. So to become stable again, the nucleus must decrease in size, which you can do by emitting an alpha particle. And again, if a nucleus has too many protons compared, protons compared to neutrons, it's unstable, since that will allow the electromagnetic force to be larger than the strong force due to the lack of neutrons providing the strong interaction without that electromagnetic repulsion. So to de you must decrease the electromagnetic repulsion, yet keep the strong attraction the same. So to do this, you can increase the stability, which by happens with the nucleus turning a proton into a neutron, which is beta plus emission. And then finally, K, if a nucleus has too many neutrons compared to protons, it's unstable. This instability comes from quantum fluctuations due to the increased quantum states of having a large number of neutrons. It's postulated that the increased number of neutrons can cause quantum fluctua uh, fluctuations which can trigger nuclear decay. So in this instance, to de increase stability, the nucleus turns a neutron into a proton, which is beta minus emission. So in nuclear decay, the nuclei change from unstable nuclei into more stable nuclei, which increases nuclear stability. Now, mo most processes by which this takes place is the weak interaction. So a W boson is passed from the unstable nucleus to the stable products. So the decay process lessens the impact of the electromagnetic force and increases the strong interaction by decreasing the nuclear radius. Now the only exception to this is alpha decay because it doesn't involve leptons or, or quarks changing type. So it decays by the strong interaction. So the alpha decay is a very, very fast interaction. Now a decay process can be thought of as a snow field on a mountain. So on a snow field, whilst the friction between the ice crystals may be supporting the snow's weight, the system is inherently unstable and wants to go to a state of lower potential energy, which is the concept of entropy. Objects tend to states of lower entropy. So to do this, the snow has to crumble, relax and release energy. So a disturbance will facilitate this path, path to a state of greater entropy. And again, this is very, very similar to an unstable nucleus, which is unstable because the electromagnetic and strong interactions are equal to each other. So an unstable nucleus will move towards the ground state, a stable state, and radioactively decay products such as energy or particles, and the total energy was distributed over a larger number of quantum states. So the stability is increased as the energy is spread out over more quantum states, decreasing the entropy of the nucleus. So like an avalanche going down a mountain hill, avalanche is ob observed in one direction towards the ground state. State, the state with the largest number of ways in which the available energy could be distributed, which is the same as a radioactive nuclear decay. Without placing work into the system, energy always spreads out over more quantum states. Now, radioactive decay needs this activation to start it, like a spark causing a fire. Now, for a snow avalanche, the energy comes from a disturbance, like a noise or a movement. And in the case of an excited atomic nucleus, the arbitrarily small disturbance comes from the interaction of the forces in the nucleus and the exchange of a boson. Now, the similar sizes of the electromagnetic and strong interaction in the nucleus means a small disturbance can cause a decay. So in certain cases, actually random quantum fluctuations are theorized to promote the nucleus to relax into an energy state, which is the decay in what we call quantum tunneling. So let's just clarify what we know by radioactive decay. Nuclear radiation is emitted by an unstable atomic nuclei to become more stable. Now, nu nuclear radiation is ionizing radiation because it can produce ions by knocking electrons out of the atoms it collides with. So an unstable nucleus can decay by emitting either an alpha particle, beta particle, gamma ray, or neutron. Now, the different types of radiation can be identified experimentally using their properties. Penetrating power or absorption by different materials can be measured. Now, penetrating power is used in industry to control the thickness of sheets of aluminium foil, paper and steel. So let's consider alpha, beta and gamma emissions and let's see what their different properties are. So the first one to consider is alpha radiation. Alpha radiation is the release of an alpha particle and occurs in large elements like uranium and radium. So an alpha particle is two protons and two neutrons and the alpha particle doesn't travel very far so the best way to protect yourself from alpha radiation is to keep about a meter away or use clothing or a face mask. Now again this process occurs due to the strong interaction and it happens with the exchange 
change of a gluon. Now let's have a summary of alpha radiation. So it's important that alpha particles will deflect in electromagnetic fields and alpha particles produce 10 to the 4 ions in every millimeter it travels, which is the most ionizing type of radiation. Now alpha particles are just helium nuclei. Now it's important that helium is safe whilst alpha is dangerous as the alpha has no electrons, which means it will, it, it will ionize electrons with other atoms and it will travel much faster than normal atoms. So that's why alpha is dangerous. Now it's important to know, as we said before, alpha radiation, as it's positively charged, is deflected in electrical and magnetic fields towards the negative and south pole. Now a beta particle is emitted when a neutron in the nucleus changes into a proton, releasing a negative charge in the form of a fast moving electron. Now again, this process occurs due to the weak interaction as it involves leptons and a quark change. So this happens due to the exchange of a W boson. Now beta particles again have a specific charge, the high specific charge of any of the radioactive emissions and beta particles produce 10 to the two ions in every millimeter they travel. Now a beta particle is different from a regular electron because a regular electron exists in energy levels around the nucleus, whilst a beta particle originates from the nucleus. Now beta radiation, as it's negatively charged, is deflected in electrical and magnetic fields towards the positive or north pole. Now like mentioned before, this deflection is greater than alpha radiation as the beta particle has a high specific charge, charge to, divided by mass, than the alpha particle. Now, after a nucleus has emitted either an alpha or a beta particle, it can have too much energy. So we say it's in an excited state. So it tends to get rid of this energy by emitting a very high frequency photon called a gamma ray to go back to ground state. Now, gamma rays have no mass and no charge, but gamma radiation is very penetrating and has a long range. So you need to protect yourself with at least 10 centimeters of lead or be quite a long distance away from a gamma source. So gamma radiation has no specific charge and it produces 10 to the one ion and every millimeter it travels. Now gamma radiation is fundamentally no different from light, but gamma is more dangerous than light as it has a higher frequency, so it carries more energy per second and therefore has a greater ability to ionize. Now gamma radiation, as it has no charge, is not deflected in either electrical or magnetic fields. So this ionizing radiation is dangerous because ionization can damage the atoms of molecules and living cells. High doses of ionizing radiation can kill living cells and even low doses can cause cell mutation and cancerous growths. The ionizing effects of alpha, beta and gamma radiation are different, so have different health risks associated with them. Alpha radiation is dangerous inside the body as it affects all the surrounding tissues, but outside the body it only affects cells in the skin and the eyes, whilst beta radiation are dangerous inside and outside the body as they can reach cells throughout the body. Now we can examine the properties of radioactivity using radioactive sources. These tend to be kept in lead line boxes to prevent alpha and beta leaving the box and reducing the amount of gamma radiation leaving the box. Now the lead itself does not become radioactive, it will just block the radiation. Now the sources themselves should always be handled with tongs. Now this prevents your hands from becoming contaminated. Now contamination is the process of an unstable nuclei coating an object. This is different from irradiation as that's the process of the ionizing radiation passing through the object. Now contamination is a a lot more dangerous than irradiation because contamination leads to long-term irradiation and the distance factor in nuclear radiation is removed. Now the sources should always be placed in secure handle never touched by your hands so this prevents your hands from becoming contaminated. Now you would always place a source in a holder found in a clamp stand but it's important that this holder will become contaminated after use. Now when working with ionizing radiation people must always take precautions to protect against irradiation and contamination. Now this includes keeping as far away as possible from the radiation source, spending as little time as possible in the presence of the radiation source and shielding yourself from the radiation using either concrete barriers or lead plates. Now you can measure how many radioactive particles, alpha, beta or gamma, hit a tube with a Geiger Muller counter. Now this can't tell us the difference between the different types of radiation, but we can use it to measure the count of a radioactive 
objective source. Now, before you take any measurement, you should always uh, measure the background count. Now, any radioactive reading must have the background removed from its value, which we call the corrected reading. So that's just the amount of ra uh, radioactive emissions in the background of the actual area you are in. So there are many different sources of background radiation. These include the air, because radioactive radon rocks, uh, gas is released from rocks, which is normally the largest part of background radiation on the Earth. You've got grounds and buildings, because nearly all rocks on Earth contain radioactive materials. You've got cosmic radiation. Cosmic rays are particles from space. When they collide with the particles in the upper atmosphere, they produce nuclear radiation. Living things is a source of background radiation because all plants and animals contain carbon and some of this will be car radioactive carbon-14. And finally, artificial radiation. Radiation made by humans from either medical or industrial sources. Now, there is always a background reading in every measurement taken. So you've always got to consider the effect of the background radiation reading. Now the longer you take your reading, the lower the percentage uncertainty of the background. This occurs because radioactive decay is a random effect and has to be treated differently when calculating its percentage uncertainty. In addition, you've got to take multiple measurements for the background count and then take an average value. Be aware there can be no anomalous values as radioactive decay is a random process. So a Geiger-Muller counter can be used to test the effect of air on the radiation, which we call the range of radiation. So in these investigations, you move the Geiger-Muller counter away from the radioactive source until no discernible reading can be taken by the device. You can also use the background, the Geiger-Muller counter to test the effect of objects on the radiation, which we call the penetration of the radiation. So in these investigations, you place the counter on and the source on either side of an object and see if you get a measurable value on the counter. Again, you can also look at how the radioactive emission is affected in electromagnetic fields. So it's important to note that even beta particles will follow Fleming's left-hand rule in a magnetic field and you'll, you can work out the direction they will move in. This is a synoptic link to both magnetic fields and specific charge which is found in other parts of the course. Now the nature of gamma radiation leads to an important property when carrying out nuclear experiments. Gamma radiation is never completely absorbed, unlike alpha and beta. It just gets weaker and weaker and weaker until it can't be distinguished from the background. So, this is a very important principle in physics called the inverse square law, which we'll look at in upcoming lessons. So it's important to note that it can never truly uh, disappear from your readings. It will only get smaller and smaller until it can't be distinguished from the background count. So you'll notice in these particular sets of experimental results, the gamma rays will have been absorbed at approximately 4 meters since the radiation count is now the same as the background count approximately so therefore we can say that therefore there must be no alpha beta or gamma radiation coming from that object so what have we learned in today's lesson we should hopefully understand the properties of radiation and experimental identification of boom using simple absorption experiments uh, and also the relative hazards exposure to humans, applications to include thickness measurements of aluminium, foil, paper and steel, applications to include the safe handling of radical sources and what the background radiation is, examples of its origins and experimental elimination from calculations. So if we've been successful in today's lesson, you should be able to understand why radioactive activity occurs in nuclei, understand the different composition types of radioactive emissions and understand the different properties of the different types of radioactive emissions. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on radioactivity and an introduction to radiation. Thank you very much for listening and have a lovely day.